Um, and, you know, feel free. I want to let everybody know if you wanted to chat in questions. I did get a chance to read your questions prior to um, to the start of this. So if you do have questions, uh, do feel free to pop those into the chat. We will see them. And uh, I am going to do my best to answer some of the questions that you so kindly um, answered prior to uh, joining as a registrant. If I don't, we will certainly have time at the end for me to address those. And I just wanted to uh, let you know, we will get to everybody, everybody's concerns. So, okay, it's getting close to that five after. So I'd really love to begin. Madeline, are we good to go, you think? Okay. So welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here with me today to learn about this very important topic of feeding your kids with love and confidence. But first, I just want to start by saying that, like many of you, I have been deeply affected by the recent tragedy in Israel and terrorist attack on our people. It has been nothing short of a nightmare to witness. I'm sending you support and love today and also to those who are directly affected. And I hope that you are getting the rest, recovery, and food that you need to have the strength to endure the hardships that we all now face. Um, Yisrael, hi. So with that, I am going to begin and hope you take this time for yourself right now to relax, take a deep breath, and understand that our discussion today is really meant to inspire you and motivate you rather than add yet another stressor to your plate. So I'm going to start by sharing a quotation from a dietitian and family therapist well known in the nutrition world, Ellen Satter. She says, if parents do their jobs with feeding, children do their jobs with eating, which means they will eat they will eat the amount they need. They will eat an increasing variety of food. They will grow predictably, and then they will learn to behave well at the table. We are going to talk all about those jobs today and how we can truly feed our family um, with love and confidence. So just a little bit about who I am and why I put this talk together. My name is Marissa Beck. I've been a registered dietitian nutritionist for over 13 years in various spaces, mostly in corporate wellness, where I served employees and their families, providing medical nutrition therapy and running incentive programs. I've also been in the process of becoming um, certified as a, a board certified eating disorder specialist and certified intuitive eating counselor and have professional level trainings with the Ellen Satcher Institute. Um, I, uh, I've also um, held board positions with local and state dietetic chapters for years, and am currently the president-elect of the Washington Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is a three-year term. Last but not least, I am mom to two girls, ages eight and five, and because of them, I have a special interest in helping parents navigate the world of childhood nutrition. Um, so most of us grew up surrounded by something called diet culture, which fosters an unhealthy relationship with food you know, often at the expense of individual health. A parent coach and writer who I like a lot, her name is Una Miller Hansen, who educates about parenting without diet culture, says parenting without diet culture is not about perfection. It's about self-compassion and learning and trying again. Trying again, not just with food, but with so many aspects of parenting. We can try again. If there is anything that you take away from today, it is this. I want you to know that wherever you are in your food journey with your kids, it is not too late to make changes and learn and grow with your family. So as parents, we have a lot of pressure on ourselves to get it right, right? Especially when it comes to food. Couple that with having different eating patterns in one home, 
this is hard, my friends. Let's be honest, you know, something that's supposed to feel so simple, feeding the family can instead feel really complex. And it doesn't help when you're out of ideas for meals and snacks, you have food battles at the table all the time, and you're just plain exhausted, you know, by needing to satisfy everybody in the family, especially your selective eaters, which um, otherwise is a other name for picky eaters. So you're in the right place today if all of this resonates with you. Just a little side note on a personal level, I totally understand the struggle. I don't love that my third grader is what we would call a selective eater, whereas my younger one is more adventurous. But as I watch my kids grow and learn to like new foods at their own pace, it helps me as a parent to stick with a framework and rely on the research that we know supports kids in becoming competent eaters. So what is competent eating? Because this is the goal. That is what brought you here today, whether you know it or not. So let me read this to you because it is the backbone for everything we are going to discuss today. Competent eating is a term coined by Ellen Satter herself, who I brought up before and I will bring her up again. She's a child feeding therapist and dietitian and she shares the following. Eating competence is being positive, comfortable, and flexible with eating, as well as matter of fact and reliable about getting enough to eat of enjoyable food. Even though they don't worry about what and how much to eat, competent eaters do better nutritionally, are more active, sleep better, and have better medical tests. They are more self-aware and self-accepting, not only with food, but in all ways. To be a competent eater, be relaxed, self-trusting, and joyful about eating, and take good care of yourself with food. So how are we going to help our kids become competent eaters? <laughs> I know we all want that. Today, I'm going to walk you through three concepts that will help you and your kids grow and learn to become a competent eater. First, we're going to talk about the implementation of the trust model um, that's the framework that will help guide your decisions. It's called the division of responsibility. Next, we will discuss how to gently acclimate kids to more food variety through increased food exposure. And finally, I will share a whole bunch of practical ideas that you can try so that you feel supported with some next steps. And not on this slide, I want to mention that You'll want to stick around until the end because I do have a really exciting opportunity only for the registrants of this SJCC Nutrition Talk, and I know you're going to love it, so stay tuned till the end. So the trust model, again, is by Ellen Satter, and it is called the Division of Responsibility. Simply put, the parent is responsible for what and when to feed, and the child is responsible for how much and whether or not to eat. This starts from birth and heads into adolescence until the adolescent or co college age student can fully do both jobs. The division of responsibility is really, you know, the foundation of how we raise competent, intuitive eating kids who really learn how to listen to their bodies, trust their own hunger and fullness cues, and eat food that their family eats. And for the parents, the division of responsibility helps alleviate stress at mealtimes since, yes, you know, while it's hard not to say eat more of your veggies or don't eat more of the fries, when you trust this framework, you are buying into the idea that it is more important for your kids to trust their own innate instincts of self-regulation than to focus exclusively on the components in their food, you know, and whether or not it's healthy. By focusing on the division of responsibility, you are also creating a lifelong trusting relationship between yourself and your child. And who doesn't want that? I cannot tell you just how many times I counsel adolescents, you know, in my private practice, college age kids, even adults who reflect on their childhood eating experience with me and that they were controlled by their caregivers at mealtime and how now they have to relearn and reparent themselves on how to trust their own internal cues and be at peace with their bodies. So 
you know, this framework helps you get ahead of all of this. Um, and I really, really love it for that reason. You really are able to get ahead of that so that you can reframe feeding from getting kids to eat to letting kids eat, right? That, that reframe is very, very valuable here. Now, I know what you're going to say since I hear this all the time, but isn't it my job to make sure my kids get the nutrients they need? Yes, partly, but feeding isn't about the nutrients. It's not just about the nutrients, right? That is one element of it. And nutrition is about balance, right? Not getting the perfect balance at every meal, especially since we know that kids tend to get a variety of vitamins and minerals from a lot of different foods throughout the week, not necessarily every meal. They also, our, our food supply is fortified, so they're getting it from that. Um, and even if they have a low selection of foods they like, they tend to not have nutrient deficiencies. Um, and if they do, you can always work with a dietitian and pediatric uh, a pediatrician to solve for this, um, if, if that's noticeable. Nutrients alone do not help kids grow the way they need to grow, <laughs> nor does it help them to like new foods that they have, uh, you know, the nutrients you want them to eat. And nor do the nutrients help kids learn to trust their own bodies, right? Because when it comes to food, the way we feed our kids, how we feed them and how we talk about food and our bodies is equally, if not more important. So this Venn diagram that you see here, it was created by Jill Castle. She's a pediatric dietitian and childhood nutrition expert. And what I love about this is that she blends these concepts together really nicely in this graphic, which reflects all of the current research we know about this and growth. And it shifts the paradigm about feeding kids, right? So the nutrients are part of the equation. And then as you see, the parent is in charge of the menu, so you get to decide what's important to bring into your home, but the feeding environment impacts your child's development, you know, in being open to even eating these nutrients. <laughs> and when we see feeding struggles and growth pattern concerns with child development, that last bubble, most times we need to assess the feeding environment more so than the actual food intake. So that's the big takeaway here. A lot of the professionals and my colleagues they're not going to just jump to conclusions that there's nutrient de deficit. They're usually going to look at the feeding environment when we see picky eating and other forms of disordered eating. So how do you implement this? Knowing the framework is not the same thing as doing it. So even if you knew about Ellen Satter's division of responsibility, you know, having this insight about it is just the beginning and it's the awareness of it that will start to help you implement it. So what do I mean by this? Here are some of my favorite ways to implement the division of responsibility um, and help kids learn to love food, right? That's their goal with becoming a competent eater. Enjoy food and eat what your family serves, right? We want them to eat what you are serving to them. So number one, I recommend cooking with your kids. I know, I know, so much time. We don't have that kind of time. It doesn't have to be all the time. It could be as simple as letting them choose their favorite muffin or cookie and starting there, right? Peer-reviewed research, and I left you with this study here um, with the PMID link, shows that the impact of cooking will improve attitudes and behaviors of school-age children. And personally, I see this even happening in my own home. My little one loves to chop and peel. <laughs> you know, she's more open to eating those foods. Whereas my big one, the selective eater, she doesn't actually prefer to be in the kitchen, right? So there's not that tie-in. So I try to help her, especially as a selective eater, if you have one, you want to let them choose what they want to make sometimes so that maybe they feel more comfortable being in the kitchen. They feel more safe doing things with food and, and manipulating it with their hands. And the more that they do that, the more they'll want to explore and feel more comfortable, right? These are baby steps here. And it is especially important if you're creating that no pressure environment that we just talked about. So, you know, if we're obviously creating this high pressure environment where they only get to eat things if they do certain things, such as eating certain foods, this won't feel as enjoyable and it will actually increase the anxiety. So this all has to take place with really no pressure about eating the actual food, just the exposure. Which brings me to number two, it's not just cooking. Getting kids exposed to food 
And eating it isn't just about tasting it and swallowing it. You can help develop healthy food preferences in preschool children uh, all the way through adolescence. And we see this, you know, all the way up um, by sensory learning. So things like smelling, touching, looking, and learning about the food, things like where it comes from, how it grows, how it got all the way from the farm to our plates. You know, this is all part of the process of letting kids learn to love new foods. My older daughter, again, you know, selective eater, we usually bring her a few times a year to the farm, you know, to pick things. It's it's not the easiest of things to do, especially in the weather right now, but we bring her there. And why is she, you know, out of nowhere, she'll start to eat the herbs there or she'll start to point to new plants and we bring them home. And this is all about that experience, that sensory experience of getting them exposed to new flavors um, in all these different environments. Number three, more research suggests that acting as a positive role model can help influence children's eating behaviors. So this piece of research is often my favorite one because it helps shift the focus from your kids being the problem, problem, you know, to maybe we have to look internally to ourselves, right? The research suggests that if we role model behaviors that we want to see in our kids, then they are more likely to follow those behaviors, um, both negative and positive ones. So as an example, if you're skipping breakfast, not valuing it, right? Neither will they. And I actually had to catch myself because I was noticing one morning that I was emptying the dishwasher and I was getting lunches together and I was kind of like running around the kitchen and, um, and I usually eat breakfast, but I just wasn't doing it with them. And I noticed one of my kids said, mom, do you ever sit down and eat? And when she said that, I, I, I actually stopped. I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> and I'm going to do that with you. And I feel that when you are, are able to do it, it doesn't even need to be a long period of time. Even if they see you sitting for two minutes and eating something, right? Sitting down, showing them that you value it, right? This is a great role modeling um, act, uh, behavior. The other thing to role model is if you do not believe that all bodies are good bodies, neither will they, right? If you believe that certain bodies are healthier than others based on their weights, they are going to believe that. And if you're associating foods with those weights of, of increasing or decreasing those weights, and so will they. So we don't want that. That actually really limits kids and that does not help them learn to like new foods or their bodies for that matter. So we really want to get into a habit of um, believing in ourselves that all body, bodies are good bodies and sharing that um, with our children. It doesn't mean you have to be a perfect parent, by the way. It just it just means we have to investigate our own eating behaviors and patterns to see if we need to change anything up, right? Just like that breakfast example I gave with myself. Um, you know, just kind of do a little self-check. Number four, family meals. No matter what you are serving, family meals have been shown to impact children's eating preferences and set the foundation for healthy eating habits. I just listed one study here, but there is plenty of research that supports this and as well, you know, helps us model all of the behaviors we want to see our kids seeing, including how to behave at the table or, you know, not being a jerk and taking all the strawberries, you know, asking the rest of the family first if they want more. So family meals, there's a whole lot of great stuff uh, that happens at the table. And I know a lot of families don't have the time during the week. So what I would say is, at least try to schedule a few times per week if possible. It also doesn't always have to be the, the same. It doesn't have to be dinner. It could be a breakfast like we were just saying, but sitting down at the table is super important. Number five, ensuring that there is always one food at the table that each member of the family enjoys, right? This was an incredible recommendation I learned early on uh, by Marian Jacobson. Uh, she's also a dietitian and family nutrition expert. And in the next part of this talk today, I'm going to get into more about how you can do this with meals. And then last but not least, as Ellen says, you set the structure by providing regular meals and snacks with no grazing in between and making eating times pleasant. So how do you make them pleasant? You make coming to the table the most fun. Have a game of trivia, do silly questions, share the most fun part of your day, make it so unique and fun to your family and Less about if your child ate enough broccoli, right? If that high anxiety of coming to the table, oh, they're going to talk to me again about how I don't really eat that well, or I'm not eating this, or I'm eating too much of that. That's correlated with lower ability to feel safe to try new foods and listen to hungerfulness cues. 
And trust me, I know from experience, I hate it when I've made such an amazing meal that I know tastes good. <laughs> and I know that my kids probably would like it. And they're like, no, no, I don't want to, I want to do it. So in those moments, we have a tendency, right? The default is, oh, but just try it. I, you didn't even try it. Like, how do you know you don't like it, right? At least take a bite, right? In those cases, we just want to step back, hold our tongue, don't do anything reactive, place it on a table, show how much you enjoy it. They may or may not partake. That's frustrating sometimes. You can share qualities about the food, about what you like about it. Oh, this tasted crunchy. Oh, this was soft. Oh, I kind of like this with the sauce tonight, right? That's totally an opinion that you can share. It's your opinion. So that could sometimes help your kids be more interested in seeing what are you eating. So now I want to dive into how to gently acclimate kids to more food variety through increased food exposure now that you have the idea of that framework to use. And before I jump into this, I just wanted to say, I know that this framework is, is easier said than done. So this is a work in progress. I don't expect after tonight's you know talk that you're just going to perfectly succeed at the, at the division of responsibility. Nobody does when they first start to implement this. This is a trial and error, and it's seeing how you could always improve. And remember, you can always try again, going back to that first quote. Okay, so deconstructed meals. I like to do this. Um, deconstructed meals really are amazing. So what are they? They allow you to basically, as the parent, make one meal versus 17 <laughs> for the family. And then, you know, like Marianne Jacobson suggests, you can ensure that everyone has at least one thing that they like to eat at the table. Um, so in this Taco Tuesday example that you see here on the slide, my husband and I like a fully loaded taco, whereas my selective eater usually only eats cheese and corn tortillas, as you see here, but she's branching out and slowly at her own pace, she's now willing to put some guacamole into it. Um, because she's, you know, not, not only she's watching my husband and I eat this meal, but she's also watching her little sister, the five-year-old, you know, self-load up a taco. And <laughs> yes, you know, when you have your kids doing this themselves, they're going to get ingredients everywhere when they serve themselves. But I do highly recommend that you let them serve themselves that's part of the fun and the learning. And, you know, they can help clean up afterwards, which actually also helps them to try to stay a little neater at the table. It's a good incentive so that they don't actually have to pick up those crumbs later on. Um, so this is a great example of how to expose your kids without pressure. Let them choose what to eat. And this way you're offering the spirit of the meal, which is that it's Taco Tuesday, even though everyone is choosing what they want at this meal. It's not Taco Tuesday and also omelet Thursday and, you know, pasta Tuesday, right? You're not having all the different meals at one night. <laughs> this is just one meal and everybody choose what they want. So remember, it's your job. Huh? It's not your job, I should say, to satisfy everyone or ensure your kids get enough protein or enough carrots at every meal. If you offer variety and balance, which I will show you how to do next, rest assured your kids are certainly getting what they need. Okay, so I did get a question. Um, I wanted to address it now. The question in the audience was, at what point does the division of responsibility transition to the child having more independence in choosing what and when to eat? What is the best way to make this transition? And any resources to help on this topic would be so helpful. And I will tell you, so it really depends on the child and their level of you know, planning abilities, executive function, but I also think it's about you setting the tone of they pretty much know that they are eating consistent meals and snacks, predictable meals and snacks. I always recommend for most people from toddlers onward. So toddlers, maybe sometimes they need four meals or even babies more five, but once you get past that stage, three meals, two to three snacks, depending upon activity. If they're kind of consistently doing that versus grazing, right, then we're not really ready to relinquish control. We want to show them that, that consistent schedule, listening to their bodies, that could happen at different ages for kids. I've seen it happen as early as a seven-year-old being able to plan her entire lunchbox, right, because they have a lot of self-motivation driven. They are able to really pretty easily put things together with your help and guidance, whereas some teenagers and adult <laughs> college age kids can't even do it. So I do think it really depends on the kids and their, their, ready of, uh, their level of readiness uh, for that. But we generally 
want to see this happening as they head into high school and getting into college, right? I know that as they get older, they go into the cabinets and maybe they're just kind of deciding on their own because they're bigger, they're stronger, they could open up things, they could make their own food. And when you start to see that initiative, I would run with it. I would say, yeah, yeah, this is, this is great that you're interested in this. By the way, did you know we're having dinner in an hour? So just listen to your body because don't want you to overfill yourself now because I do want you to come to the table. Um, Hope that helps. And of course, I have more resources at the end. So let's talk about meal planning and how to offer variety and balance. If you're a newbie at this or even just feel overwhelmed with meal planning, I recommend just starting with one meal. It could be breakfast, it could be lunch, snack, or dinner, but it doesn't have to be all of them. <laughs> you know, so often I feel like we feel like we have to do all of the meals with meal planning every single night. I, I don't want that for you. I want this to feel not stressful. So if it's stressful to do that, then one meal is your um, goal. So we want to reframe meal planning as just planning to have food around, right? Just planning to have it around. You can order in that food. You're planning to order in. You can half cook that food where some of it is from the freezer, and some of it is fresh, but your plan is to have a plan when the week gets wonky. This way you don't get stressed, right? And you don't end up eating things you actually don't want to eat. I know I've done that before, right? Or spending more money on takeout than you wanted to spend because you didn't really have a plan. This is all considered great care, by the way, and child care when you are thinking about all the things you need for the week. Um, and your family is top of mind when you're balancing out um, your, your weekly events. And that in, does include meal planning. And it helps with sports after school, right? If you wanna have quick meals available or snacks or one of your kids is highly selective. So you want to have foods that they enjoy at the table as well. So when I coach parents on this, I like to have them start with a simple meal planner. Simple, this does not need to be fancy. When I say electronic here on this slide, I'm literally referring to a notes section on your phone or on your, you know, Outlook calendar and creating an event on that day. You don't need any special sharing app and you certainly, you know, could use paper as well. Good old paper meal planning is still in fashion. So when I meal plan and I'm referring to a specific meal right now, let's just call it dinner since I know that gets everyone hung up the most. I tend to think about all of the possible categories that I want to offer. So generally speaking, it's always some sort of protein, carb, and veggie. And I also like to offer a little raw fruit and veggie plate that I call the hangry plate, which I will get into in a little bit. But for the most part, these are the main categories that we are looking at when it comes to meal development. And the idea is to think about your week ahead and all of the activities you have and start creating your deconstructed meals. You'll uh, get this template today as part of your registration and you will also get one week of dinner ideas using this exact approach. And my personal approach is to, yes, focus on nutritious food, but let's make sure it's also delicious and easy and that there's always something at the, the table that everybody likes. No one has time for following complex recipes during the week, not even me, unless you want to, and kudos to you. But all of these ideas that I have here are pretty straightforward. They have a protein, a carbon, a veggie, a fruit, and a miscellaneous item like a dip or a sauce to tie the whole dish together, and a dessert option. And this is deconstructed. So for example, on Monday, I like serving fish, and I pan sear it with butter, salt, and garlic powder, and you guessed it, my husband and my adventurous eater love the salmon and my selective eater, you know, might have the smallest nibble in the world or none of it, but she does like on that night, if you could see the roasted broccoli and French fries, which, you know, that's easy. That goes in the oven at the same time and the French fries are frozen. So I, you know, pop that out. Broccoli, you could decide if you want to actually chop that and get it whole or if you want to get it pre-cut whatever floats your boat. So we all enjoy this meal, especially with that Met Market uh, garlic aioli sauce and lemon juice, which I like to use as a dipping sauce for my fries and sauce for the broccoli and salmon. It's delicious. Whereas maybe other kids in the family the, or my or my husband even, he actually doesn't use that dip. So I feel like everybody kind of has enjoyment at that meal in their own way. And it's one meal. It's the spirit of the meal deconstructed. 
tonight, for example, we had turkey sliders right before I gave this talk. And this had to be an easy night, right? I was giving this lecture. So we had an easy bag of salad, as you see here, because this is a late night for us. So we wanted to make sure that this, uh, it was, you know, compiling these items it really need to be simple. That bag of salad has a dressing container in the salad bag so that we open up the bag and we pop that dressing in there. And yes, somebody doesn't like the dressing. So we pull out a little bit of the, of the salad so she could touch it and taste it and do whatever she wants with it. I always get a question about dessert right about now. I'm surprised I didn't get one yet, but um, because as you can see, I have listed uh, on here, dessert as an option almost every single night. And this is totally fine to offer every night if you desire, because you know if you're only having dessert when kids eat their veggies, then they will always overeat and not listen to their body's fullness cues in order to get that prize, right? They're always going to try to please you to get that. That's not what we want. And this is where issues tend to arise with control around food. So remember, since you are in control of the menu, you don't need to buy or bake foods that you don't feel comfortable offering to your kids, but just know that when it comes to dessert, we do want you to offer it so that you can destigmatize dessert and allow kids to in, engage with it without them feeling like it's a forbidden food to them. Even Ellen Satter. So Ellen Satter suggests serving it one serving with dinner. That's the only thing she doesn't say, oh, you know, you could have kind of however much you want of one serving with dinner to neutralize the food so that it doesn't become a power struggle about, you know, healthy eating. I know from the registration questions that some of you are in that baby and toddler phase. So I just wanted to add in a slide about some of my favorite baby led weaning uh, starter foods as it relates to the spirit of the meal. So you can still serve them the spirit of the meal and practice baby led weaning so long as the food that you're serving can easily be mashed between the thumb and the forefinger, right? If you could do this, then they have a very strong jaw, even with the uh, teeth not coming in, they will be able to mash that. And as babies grow, you can offer spices that your family likes to eat since babies love exploring new tastes and textures like cinnamon on sweet potato or tahini sauce with cauliflower. And they are actually, some kids are really adventurous at this age. Um, and so I would take advantage of it before uh, the kids kind of head into that more natural picky-ish selective eating phase that happens between the ages of two to seven. Um, you'll see that they get a little bit more uh, un unfamiliar food is not as easy to offer. <laughs> so if you're in this phase, definitely offer as many, many foods as you can um, uh, because you will be able to get a lot of different exposure in uh, that period of time. Along those same lines, I saw a question come in about throwing food, and I wanted to be sure I addressed that in Marianne Jacobson's family dinner rules. As you can see, throwing food is rule number five, and we address this in a sensory approach way, which is that we don't throw food, but you can touch, smell, even lick any part of your meal, and this helps with kids who are also selective and might not be throwing food anymore, but perhaps they're not able to keep it on their plate, right? They don't like it there. So you can say, hey, you know, I'd like you to try to keep the food on your plate. Um, or maybe you keep it on a plate on the side, right? It has to be in front of them. It depends on how resistant they are to that. Um, but you can touch it or you could smell it. You could even lick it, right? You can tell them those same things. As you can see with the other rules that it, they really do follow the implementation of the division of responsibility quite nicely. So as an example, in that first rule, we are focusing on one of the child's jobs in the division of responsibility, which is whether or not to eat. That's really their job. But you can still do your job, right? The when of inviting them to sit at the table with you, right? They, they should come to the table, even if they're not willing to eat. It's still, we'd like you to come sit with us. I love number two, we talked about that, that there will always be something at the table you like. Number three, getting helpers involved. I know we like when our kids set the table or clean up crumbs or peel things. Um, number four is super important to respect the cook. No complaining or yucking someone else's yum. And of course, no throwing food. Number six, when you're done eating, that's it until breakfast. 
So this helps to curtail that second or third dinner after dinner, which I know some families do since kids tend to then not eat the dinner, uh, you know, because they know that they're going to be getting a yogurt or a banana an hour later. So if that's you, if you feel like you're offering a little snack or a dinner after dinner, I would question that one um, unless they're babies who need another you know, feeding with milk or they're a toddler and you're kind of weaning them off of that last snack. I, I would say it's probably not ideal. You know, as we get older, we may notice we're staying up later. Maybe we actually do need to fill our bellies with something else. But usually kids, elementary school ages, even into middle school, we don't really want to get them into that habit. So I would stop doing that so you could really help your kiddos learn to eat at the table with you um, and really feel like they're able to listen to your bodies and, and fill their tummies. Um, adequately. And of course, number seven, for goodness sake, please bring your plate up to the sink when you're done, right? We want all of them to do that. So I mentioned something earlier today called the hangry plates. And so let me just dive a little bit into what this is and why I love it so much. This is part of my meal planning process. And I really highly recommend that you implement something like this in your own home. So the hangry plate is it's essentially a plate of raw veggies and fruits, and it sits out before dinner as a fun munch plate for the cook, you know, or the kids and anyone who finds himself just lingering in the kitchen before dinner's ready. And I call it hangry because at this point in the day, my whole family is definitely a combination of hungry and ang hungry and angry. <laughs> so hangry. Um, the plate contains all of those much needed vitamins, minerals, and fiber from produce that really might have been missing during a day. Fruits and vegetables, right? We tend not to eat them as often during a day. Maybe we do as adults, maybe kids do, but this tends to be one of the major areas, and I saw it in the registration uh, questions that people have a problem with, like they're not getting enough vegetables. The rule of thumb is you offer this hangry plate, you don't incentivize it, bribe, nag about it just as offered right there on the table. Anyone's allowed to interact or not interact with the hangry plate. I find that if parents feel like they are really concerned about their child's nutrient intake, this takes a load off, right? They can start off with their kids' favorite fruits and vegetables and serve that hangry plate every day. And it stores nicely in a Tupperware with paper towels. So you can reuse whatever's not eaten. So it's easy. And I especially love it if your dinner sides, you know, don't have any produce, the hangry plate can stay out at dinner and literally fill this void. So it's kind of like a, you know, piggy bank, you know, you're kind of feeling a little bit more of a safety net for you just to offer something like this every day. So totally fine to offer the same vegetables every day. It doesn't need to be a medley of things. And actually the plate you see here, I don't even offer this amount of fruits and vegetables. This has a lot of different ones. I usually just offer one fruit and one vegetable. Um, and it goes back to, you know, if let's say a kid is interacting with that plate and having a lot of it, that's a great opportunity for you to say, so glad you like this. Make sure you ask other people if they would like some too, right? Because this is about behavior as well. This is, we're, maybe we don't have more, uh, more strawberries. I know I don't buy boxes of strawberries every single night of the week. We may have one whole box or maybe two. And if we put it all out for one night, like that's it. So I want to make sure everybody has um, opportunities to to eat some and you can totally say those things if you see a kid just kind of gobbling it up and not really being respectful of others around them. So after school snacks is a big one. I like serving bento boxes as a fun way to create a balanced snack that's healthy, delicious, and mobile. And it doesn't have to be this healthy looking. That's a pretty healthy looking picture. But I do like to offer a few categories at snacks, much like I like to offer at mealtimes. So you'll see here, we want to ensure we're hitting a few food groups like carb options, protein, healthy fats, and produce. So another example would be Nutella, apples, and cereal to have a mix of options. And, you know, of course, ensure that there's at least one thing your kiddos like for snack. This is also a great opportunity to trial new foods if dinner's hard. So as an example, if you know your child likes Nutella and an apple, will they like it on a pear or on a banana? Will they like it warmed up? Like Nutella is a little bit more warm and spreads a lot easier. There's so many options. So this is called food chaining. We could talk a little bit at the end about that if you're interested. Food chaining is where you take basically a food that your kid does like, and then you switch it up a little bit, but that the texture is still the same or the uh, category is still the same. So if they like Nutella with apple, 
would they like Nutella with pear, right? Where, where that's food chaining, kind of taking something they like and then doing a variety that's similar to it so we could start that exposure in a gentle way. Let's talk about processed foods because I would rather we reframe this from being processed food and talking about it like this is, you know, that this fits into your diet, right? These also are foods that that fit into your diet. They don't need to be foods that we uh, demonize, especially for things like sports nutrition, right? For kids who play sports or for kids who are really selective, it could be really essential to have processed foods as part of your child's diet without calling them unhealthy. You are still offering nutrition to your kiddos and these foods also promote the idea that all foods are valid, right? They're, that they could be a valid part of anyone's diet, um, especially if your kid's an athlete, right? This stuff is really portable. My kids are gymnasts, and so we ensure that they get both a pre- and post-workout snack if dinner isn't immediately after exercise. I really like options like this because it allows me to just maybe even keep them in the car or the horizon chocolate milk, right? Because there's such a great post-workout option for quick fuel and it's palatable. So it gets the fluids that your little athletes need as well as, you know, both the carb and the protein. So all the way around, I really love us to reframe this a little bit more so that it doesn't feel like it has to be a forbidden food and that we feel guilt for offering this. Definitely not. If your child is into smoothies, or even if they aren't, remember you can have fun preparing it together. It's a great way to try new flavors out. I like to ensure that there are all of these categories when I make smoothies, a good liquid base, and then some frozen fruit and some boosters like protein powder or seeds and nut butters. You could add greens if you want, but definitely not required. We usually love making smoothies in the summer and then popping them into popsicle molds. That's a fun way to eat your smoothie, not just drink them. School lunch is a big one. I know I'm blasting through some of this stuff, but these are all, they could be like their own little mini lectures. Like school lunch could literally be its own lecture. So I'm just going to tell you, bottom line, what my older daughter's kindergarten teacher once told me when she had started kindergarten back in the day. This teacher said to me, serve what your kid will eat, not what you want her to eat. Lunch is not the time for them to start being angry with you for shoving in some veggies that they don't like. You have to think calorically dense foods because these kids don't have a lot of time to eat, maybe 15 to 20 minutes max. And that's me being pretty generous because they are talking to their friends, not focusing on eating. <laughs> so, you know, even if they're getting school lunch, for instance, which that takes like another five minutes or standing online, maybe it takes longer. I highly recommend that, by the way, if your kid's willing to get school lunch, um, which is a great way to start exposing them to even more flavors and textures. And one day they might get something, you know, new in the cafeteria because they have been used to seeing other kids try it. So, you know, even if they're getting school lunch, you still want to make sure that you are reviewing with them the school lunch calendar in advance with the only goal of them finding something that day that they like, right? Not saying, I've seen a lot of parents do this. No, that lunch on Tuesday is so unhealthy. It's, you know, uh, whatever, uh, some, something they deem unhealthy. If you do that, it's, it, it is just going to continue to perpetuate this diet culture mindset that I can't have something that I enjoy and that I could only eat healthy foods. Otherwise, I am morally you know, a bad person for wanting or even desiring these types of foods, you know, don't do that. We want them to be able to look at the foods and just say whether or not they'll enjoy it. Yes, I like the lunch on Thursday. Nope, I don't want the lunch on Thursday. Great. You want to help me make lunch for Thursday, right? So in your handouts for today, I'm going to share some all of these quick ideas for lunch that you see here. Things like game day chili box, edamame hummus box, chai spy muffin box, uh, a chai spice muffin box, a minestrone soup box, power bite protein box, and a teriyaki meatball box. So there are recipes for all of these in your recipe pack that you will get as a gift uh, today for coming. I'm also going to include in that gift other meals for you. I call it dinner in five, which are just a short collection of satisfying dinner recipes, including meals that contain five core ingredients or less that you can combine with kitchen and pantry essentials. 
So these are easy, real easy uh, dinners. And then you could just combine other, remember, we're trying to make them into deconstructed dinner. So anything else at the table that you want everybody else to eat, that's kind of in the line with the spirit of this meal. This is, there's a lemon garlic cod, one pan salmon with artichoke and spinach, slow cooker Italian herb chicken, warm lentil quinoa salad with dill, beet and citrus salad. And then there's also a spiced weeknight collard greens here. Don't forget to plan your ordering in nights or pizza nights. Yes, I'm telling you to order in. These are really important nights for self-care, gives you a break from cooking, and it is totally okay if you order in more than you want to right now, right? Just offer a hangry plate. I promise you, it'll help you feel better about the meal balance or offering a side salad with a pizza if that makes you feel better, totally fine. But again, those are not something you have to do. Diet culture tells us we have to have meal balance all of the time, where in reality, that is not necessary to have health-related outcomes or a healthy relationship with food, as we saw with the, the studies with competent eating. I did not forget breakfast, and we'll make sure to add these recipes to your recipe pack today. If you're looking for more satisfying meals, right, you can try some higher protein fiber-filled breakfast ideas, but remember that any breakfast, even a snack, is better than having nothing. So even if, right, even if it is just an apple or a banana with peanut butter or whatever, we want to role model that behavior and help our kids get into the breakfast habit so that they can focus at school and then later on when they're older at their jobs, right? We don't want them to think it's okay to intermittently fast until 12 and then feel hangry all the rest of the day. That's not that's not a normal behavior. I have so many clients that come in and say, like, well, I just don't like breakfast in the morning. Okay, but when is your first meal then? Are you eating hours? We don't want kids to do that. So uh, I would definitely, <laughs> if that's you, Let's think about how we could get kids coming to the table in the morning. If you can't do that and they're not having anything before school, at least have them have something like on the way to school, like a bar. So in this group, in this little recipe pack, we have spinach and tomato frittata, cottage cheese with blueberries and hemp seeds, a chocolate avocado mousse smoothie, peanut butter yogurt with pear slices, some chicken sausage and kale saute, collard, uh, there's also a um, collard, <laughs> there's a uh, Greek yogurt with fruit and almonds. And again, these are all on the much higher protein and fiber side. I recommend many more carbs for kids. I just wanted to show you how to get them more um, satisfying, more, more protein and fiber rich meals in the morning. But I personally love making my kids pancakes with Kodiak cake mix. It's really easy. You just add water. We add some eggs and cinnamon sometimes. Um, and I have that recipe on my blog, so you'll be able to get that link at the end as well. I'm going to take you back to this slide because I want you to leave today with the following takeaway. You do not need to do all of the things that we talked about to be successful. You just need to do one thing that felt right to you when you heard that today for yourself and your family. And one last PS, all bodies are good bodies. I know you heard me saying that earlier. I had to add a slide in about that <laughs> and really, you know, really believing it, not just about our kids' bodies, but about our own bodies, right? If they start seeing us grabbing our love handles and say, I don't like this, they're going to look at their own bodies and do that to themselves. We don't want them doing that. So got to really value all bodies, diverse bodies, and that that is normal. <laughs> There are no bad foods, only bad attitudes about foods. Your relationship with food matters as it is inextricably linked with your child's, but it doesn't mean you have to have a good relationship with food yourself to help your child develop one. Here are my references for today. If you wanted to dive deeper into the research I presented, I also shared the PMID codes in my presentation where I cited the research. And remember, I do have a special opportunity only for the registrants of this talk today. So if you are here live or listening to the recording, please feel free to partake in this. I don't usually do this. I will be offering a few 30 minutes free family breakthrough sessions. So what are these? These are very different than my discovery calls where we kind of just learn more about you. And if you wanna start off with programming with me or counseling. This is a little different because you'll get the chance to see what it's like to troubleshoot one or two concerns 
that you have and really get some actual solutions. And we do this in about a matter of 30 minutes. So if we both feel like your nutrition concerns do warrant additional support, then we could talk about what that might look like, you know, and I can help verify your insurance benefits. Um, but you can access your spot today by scanning this QR code here on the slide, or you can copy and paste that link I shared, and that will take you to the booking page to secure your 30 minute chat with me. And don't forget, you are going to get the recipe, recipe packs and handouts as well as this recording and this slide deck. So stay tuned for that, drop in your inbox um, and as well as a feedback survey. So I really wanna thank you so much again for your time. If you wanted to follow my company, Rev Health, on social media, I am sharing the links here. The last link is how you can join my weekly free newsletter, which is devoted to helping busy parents and professionals navigate their health without the influence of diet culture. I'm going to open it up now for questions and stop the recording, but I hope you have a pleasant rest of your day and uh, evening, and I hope to see you soon.